wonderful. I had a mom who loved me and doted on me and my sister. My little brother wasn't born yet. And uh, my dad was an engineer at a local, uh, at a local chemical plant, and he went and, and went to work every morning and came home every evening, and we had dinner, and it was like uh, the Cleavers, you know? It was just the perfect little nuclear family. And then things changed a bit. We got something uh, through, through, uh, through a, a wrench into the works. My dad got asked to go on shift work to be able to, you know, learn some of the inner workings of the plant so that he could get promoted, uh, you know, by, by doing shift work. And uh, I, through my career, had the chance to do uh, some shift work. And by shift work, I mean you work, you know, either the morning shift, the evening shift, or the, the midnights or the overnight shift. And, you know, it's the three shift rotating shift. Anybody here ever done, done shift work in here? I bet there's a, yeah, yeah, I bet there's a bunch. Ken supervises a lot of people on shift. Um, so we went on shift work and things changed. There wasn't dinner with dad every night. As a matter of fact, most nights there wasn't dinner with dad. And then one night when he was on midnights, you know, he, when, when he was coming in early, you know, come in early and he would just be, he'd be dead tired because he'd been to work at a house and doing whatever, go home, go to, go to work, work all night. And he'd come home and he'd go to sleep because he was tired. And then, you know, he'd sleep and then wake up and do this afternoon routine again. But this one day I still remember, and I cannot watch the movie Field of Dreams without just becoming a blubbering little baby because of this one thing at that end scene where Kevin Costner stops his dad and said, can we have a catch? This dad who's coming, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, his dad kind of comes back from the dead as a vision kind of thing. But, um, but my dad, this one morning, this one particular late spring morning, took me out back and had a catch with me, even though he was dead tired, even though there was no reason for him, you know, I wasn't in the league, I wasn't playing anything, he wasn't getting me ready to go, you know, play a big game or anything. It's just what he chose to do, to give, to be there for me. And so I grew up in a, in a, in a family where Father's Day was very special because my father was the kind of father that I longed, still longed to be. And... Um, so when I was preparing for this sermon, I said, well, let me think about all the, the biblical examples of great fathers. And I was going to do Abraham and Isaac. We've done that in youth group. You know, tell that story is amazing when God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. And I was working on that. I worked that whole sermon up because we've done it. And it's great. It really, it's an amazing message. If you haven't read that story back in Genesis, it's worth going back to read. But Tuesday of this week, I got something different because I was working right before bed on the sermon, and uh, I was looking for other scriptures to feed in and say, okay, where can we, you know, get some New Testament flavor. And so I went back and I read the story of the lost son, the prodigal son. And uh, we can go to the next slide, uh, Ronnie. And um, I realized as I was reading it that night, rereading it, I've heard it, at least I've heard it, I had to have heard it 50 times, and I probably read it another 50. And I got something completely different. All the time growing up, I always thought that it was really about the prodigal father, a dad that kind of screws up and then gets redemption in the end, a dad that like took all of, you know, a third of his wealth. Now, Evan, I'm sorry about this, buddy, but I got to tell you how the split went, okay? So um, I have to tell you about this, how the split went uh, later. Okay, so hold on to that because you're not going to like it. So I just wanted to warn you up front. Is that cool? Okay, cool. So to understand this story about this prodigal father that I always thought was the story of the redemption of the father and the son in the end, we have to get the context for the story. So if we look back at the context of the story in the beginning of the 15th chapter of Luke, and uh, by, by the way, for those of you going, hey, he forgot to do the, the gospel read, the scripture reading before the sermon. It's embedded, so don't worry. Don't worry. Um, beginning of Luke, the beginning of the 15th chapter, Jesus has been going around everywhere teaching, and people are starting to follow him. And the beginning of the 15th chapter says, the tax collectors and sinners were coming to hear him speak. And it's like, I guess there's a special level of Hades reserved for the tax collectors because they always, you know, Luke in this case and in other gospels, they're always calling out the tax collectors because, you know, they hit you right in the pocketbook, I guess. And they were very corrupt back that, in that day. Uh, 
And he said, tax collectors and sinners were always following him around. And the scribes and the Pharisees noticed this. And in the second verse, use a great word. They, they mumbled, it says in one, they murmured. And uh, in the uh, New American Standard version of the Bible, which is probably the most literal translation we had, it says they grumbled about Jesus spending his time welcoming, the, the, the scripture says, welcoming and even eating with sinners. So that was the context that threw Jesus off into a storm of, okay, you want it? You got it. Let me tell you how this really works. And he was so, to me it seems, upset with these Pharisees and scribes, these people that followed the letter of the biblical rule of the Mosaic Code to the letter. He was so upset with them that he didn't give them one, he didn't give them two. He gave them three parables on lostness. The first was the parable of the lost sheep. Ronnie, you can go to the next one. Uh, the parable of the lost sheep. And Jesus said, you know, if you, if you um, a shepherd, he says a man has a hundred sheep and loses one, won't he go leave the 99 in the open field where they're safe and go looking for the one? And when he brings it back on his shoulders, he will call all his friends and there will be much rejoicing because his lost sheep was found. And he then goes on to say that there'll be more rejoicing in heaven for the one lost sheep that is found than for the 99 sheep that did not need redeeming. He goes on in the next story to talk about a lost woman looking for a lost coin. If you had, if this woman had ten lost coins, she had ten lost ten coins, and lost one. And these, in some versions, they call these drachma or something that would be worth about a day's wage. So it's a lot of money. And she lost this coin. And you know, this picture is not real clear, but you can see she wouldn't she. Jesus says, wouldn't she light a, light a lamp? And, and get down on her hands and knees and sweep out the whole house till she found that first coin. I put this other one in here. I don't know why, Ronnie, if you go to the next, the next picture. Because there, that looks like a more elderly woman down on her hands and knees. Or you could kind of have the hot babe who found the coin. Whatever your version of the parable works out. What, however it works for you. But so she'll rejoice and she'll call all her friends and say, I lost some money, but I found it. Isn't this cool? And the friends would rejoice with her. And so after telling those two stories on lostness, and he said, I tell you the truth, the angels in heaven will rejoice more over that one lost soul that is found than the nine that didn't need it, need to be found. And after that, you would think, okay, the scribes and the Pharisees got it. All right. He's really telling us that lost people are worthy and, and valuable to God. But Jesus apparently didn't think they had gotten the message yet. So he told them one more story that went something like this. All right, uh, this is Luke 15, 11 through 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me a share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. 
But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This was the well-read word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, just for the record, um, that's a really long scripture. That doesn't go against my sermon time. Okay, just so we, we can all agree with that. We're all good there. So how many of you, like me, by show of hands, have read this story at least once? That Okay, at least once. Good. Most everyone here. How many of you have ever seen it as sort of as I did the broken father who didn't have any, any better sense than to give the son all that he asked for when he wasn't ready, ill-prepared, no way to know how to use it. How many of you have ever thought about this story in that way? This God, that's the, the, the prodigal God, the wasteful, the extravagantly wasteful father. And I always thought about it like that growing up. And then the father gets redeemed along with the son in the end. And God laid it on my heart to get a very different reading this week. And I shouldn't go back there, but I have to, because I laid in bed and cried, because I missed this for so long, that what was really happening in the first of the story is a God who is burying us all, including me, with this extravagant, wasteful love and grace that he, we don't deserve, we haven't earned, and we have no way to earn it. And so God's pouring out on all of us the beginning of the story. You've been given so much. You've been given so much, DR. You've been given so much love, protection, grace, everything that I've poured out on you. How have you done with that? What kind of steward have you been of all that that's been poured out upon you? And the two brothers in the story, this, this story really was always to me about the lost son and the angry older brother. And then I started to, you know, kind of get caught up in the angry older brother thing. And I said, I see where he's coming from. You know, the, the young bro didn't follow the rules. He should be punished. And, uh, oh, I need to come back to you, Evan, because up there at that beginning part, the pouring out of the love, do you know how that worked back then? The pouring out of the inheritance. Uh, older bro got two shares for every single share that every other brother had. But we know from the story, Jesus starts it out, there were a man who had two sons. So that means 
He would have gotten two parts and you won. He gets 66.6667 and you get 33 and a third. So you got a third. So, but you took your third and you went off. And you said, I got all this money now, man. We're talking like Xbox, PlayStation 3, and everything I could ever want, but I'm not going to do it here because I got enough money to buy a place in Mexico. So I'm going to go run to Mexico and I spend all my money on wild living, like, you know, video games and, 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 and frozen burritos from 7-Eleven and all that stuff that you could never have. So it went something like that. But the son clearly, so the first son, what did he do with the money, with the inheritance that he took? He squandered it. It's very clear he squandered it. He's the prodigal one. He's the extravagantly wasteful one in the story. He squandered it on fun temporary happiness that would not last and knew nothing of true joy because where he wound up was feeding the pigs. And we won't go into talking about how that was the lowest thing that a Jewish person could do, you know, the swine that were unclean and all that. So he squandered his wealth that way. He squandered the generous gift that his father gave him that way. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think we had, do we have a, a squandering, uh, let's see, no, 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 uh, there he's given him the money, so okay. Next one over. Yeah, there we go. So this is the, here he is. I think this is him down in the lower left corner here. And this is classic. You can see somebody playing like a modified bagpipe or something back there. A classic wine, women, and song. That's where the money went, to wine, women, and song. So, so he squandered his wealth there. And it's interesting because the elder brother, the older brother, the older brother doesn't come off clean here either, does he? No, the older brother doesn't come off clean <laughs> Here, either uh, the older brother, um, next slide, if you would, Ronnie. The older brother, he squanders his in a different way. Here he is accusing dad. He squandered his on bitterness and anger and distancing himself from the father. If you see, when the big celebration, when there was joy in the household, all the servants taking part, everyone there, the farm, whatever the enterprise was, shut down because everybody was celebrating, probably the whole village with them. They killed the fattened calf and they brought everyone in and there was celebration and there was joy except for the one bitter, estranged son. He couldn't celebrate because he had followed the rules. He had followed the rules. Here was this son that took all of your money, went out and spent it on loose living, and Josh read the on wine, women, and song, on prostitutes, and who, else, who knows what else. And he comes back, and you give him all of this. And I'm thinking by now, the Pharisees and the scribes are going, hmm, hmm. Let's so remember the context of the story. We have those who have squandered God's gift, but have returned and returned. The tax collectors and the sinners that the Pharisees were all worried about. And the elder brother was those Pharisees and scribes themselves. The scribes and the Pharisees are the people who have followed the rule to the letter. And why should we let all of these other people that have squandered all the wealth of our country and have broken all the rules, why should we let them into our club? Jesus, you're eating with the wrong people. You should be eating with the rule followers. And Jesus is telling us, no, there's a different economy. God's economy is not our economy. It's not an economy of dollars and cents and who spends their money the best, although there was certainly some of that in his messages because we have to go back and remember the parable of the talents where Jesus ends with the people that took care of their talent, their money or whatever was given them, the skills and abilities they were given them, and the response is the response I hope to hear at the gates of heaven one day. Well done, my good and faithful servant. But there's more. Enter into the joy of your master, the elder son. The scribes and the Pharisees could not enter into the joy of their master. They squandered their rich gifts by spending it on bitterness 
and anger and resentment for what they perceive they should have and others shouldn't. So there was a lot of squandering going on, a lot of prodigaling going on here, a lot of wasteful spending, wasteful spending of love and grace, wasteful spending of hard-earned cash. And we get that down to the bottom line. God's economy is different than our economy. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And what Jesus is doing is giving us some keen insight into how God works. He's extravagant. He's wastefully extravagant because he pours his grace and love out on everyone long before they even know it. The littlest of us. When we're doing our worst and we're at our lowest and our least, he's pouring out his love and grace on us extravagantly. And when we turn and come back home, he doesn't wait for us to come all the way and then get all the rules together and do all of the wrong, you know, do all of the right stuff and then and only then. No. The minute, the second, the instant that we turn back toward God, he is already watching us, watching for us to come down the road and running. Undignified. The theme for year before last's youth rally. David danced in an undignified fashion. And what the father did in Middle Eastern culture was something very undignified. Because to run in a tunic, you know what you have to do? You've got to hike that bad boy up or it'll trip you. And you have to show off your ankles and your calves in order to hike your tunic up and run. And that was disgraceful. And he did that so that he could run out to his son. And then the word, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a Greek guy, but I looked up this word that it, uh, the NIV translates as kiss. Some of them translate as embrace. And really it's only used four times in the Bible. Uh, five, four times other than this one. Two, one of them is when Joseph embraced his brother Benjamin. And when he revealed that he was his brother, uh, after he had been messing with his brothers bef you know, before he brought the Israelites in. And he also did the same thing with his father, uh, Jacob, Joseph did, fell upon his neck. He fell upon his neck. Can I demonstrate? Joshua, stand up. And embrace a loving kiss. I know he embraced him. No, what he did was he fell upon his neck in such a way that there was a connection and a bond, a closeness and emotional sincerity about putting the master, the father, putting his hand right in here like this. Uncomfortable yet? Right in here like this. <laughs> but what, isn't that what? To have God fall upon our neck when we return and we ask for forgiveness. Mm. One interesting thing, and then we'll wrap up. If you notice how the story ended, it just quit, didn't it? Doesn't it leave us hanging? What did the brother respond? What did he do? What's he going to do? Our answer in why Jesus taught the story that way is not so that he could Socratically do that question and answer and let us respond. Remember the context. Who was he telling the story to? Yeah, those tax collectors and sinners that were there listening, but to those murmuring Pharisees and scribes. He left it open-ended. He said, wow, this guy, elder brother, never entered into his father's joy, into the celebration. And the father said, you're with me always. Everything I have is yours. And then but the son was lost and was found. I'm going back to the party. Doesn't say that, but you know he did. And then it was up to the brother. It was up to the scribes and Pharisees. How are you going to respond, scribes and Pharisees? Now you know about lostness. Three parables to help you out. So for Father's Day, for Father's Day, one more, I believe. Whoops, that's, uh, that's uh, go back one, because real quick, this is Rembrandt's uh, depiction of, the, of the, the, uh, the prodigal son. By the way, prodigal son, that term never came into use until the 1500s. Late 1400s, the word prodigal. Early to mid 1500s, prodigal son was put together with this 
story because that word's not in the Bible anywhere. It doesn't, doesn't exist in any Greek, Aramaic, or any other form. So we labeled this story that. But that's where I'm at. But see, there's no the falling of the, on the neck here. So far be it for me to upgrade a master's painting. But if it were up to me, I'd have him down in there. Okay. Next one. Every day. And I'll leave you with this, that every day is Father's Day. We are responding to the wastefully extravagant love and grace that God has for us. So every day, we need to treat it as Father's Day for God, our Father in Heaven, with a little gratitude. That's always so good. A repenting, a turning away from the things that we're doing wrong. Turning back toward God. And lastly, use those talents. The younger son squandered his. The older son squandered his. Jesus is asking in this parable, and he was, as he was asking the Pharisees and the scribes, what are you going to do with all the stuff you've been given? What are you going to do with all the stuff you've been given? What am I going to do with all the stuff I've been given? What are we in this church going to do with all the good things God has poured out on us? And in response, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, Danny, I think we're going to do uh, joys and concerns now.